You see it on TV, you read it in magazines, you hear it from your grandmother. 1992 was a big year for alternative music. But what does alternative really mean? I got five words for you. New, original, challenging, inspiring, groundbreaking. Why was it such a big year in alternative music? I got 21 words for you. Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, The Cure, Morrissey, Sonic Youth, Nine Inch Nails, Ministry, R.E.M. R.E.M. is one word in case you were counting. And in case you want to catch up on some great music, check this out, because right now, 120 Minutes presents the alternative year in rock. Welcome to the Alternative Year in Rock. I'm Dave Kendall, producer and host of MTV's 120 Minutes. That's the show where a lot of the groundbreaking alternative bands started out on MTV. And where did alternative music itself start out? Here's a very brief look back. Alternative music to me is music that's not rammed down your throat. There goes the neighborhood! Every generation needs a, a bigger noise to bludgeon them into feeling something. Things are getting a little more extreme. People need to yell a little bit louder. Much of today's alternative music traces its roots to the legendary late 60s bands The Velvet Underground and The Stooges. We all grew up with The Stooges. First Stooges home, second Fun House and Raw Power were like, you know, manifestos to us in the 70s. A lot of people at the time thought we were kind of joke and they couldn't hear the sound. In the early 70s, the Ramones taught punk rock 101. I feel like we initiated an exciting new uh, form of, of music in 1974 that has finally been accepted in America right now. <laughs> And in the summer of 76, punk exploded in Britain. The Sex Pistols, they're a big influence. Oddly enough, there's a lot of uh, Hill fans out there that aren't really aware of our, our history. And a lot that know sort of all about the Pistols. After the 76 punk explosion in England, New Wave broke on both sides of the pond. <laughs> The confusion that always existed about the punk scene and, and the new wave scene, uh, musically, those are not really types of music, but they indicate a time period where, you know, different bands were making different statements. And by the early 80s, post-punk and electro-pop had invaded the chart. It's, it's been frustrating at times in the past when we're considered alternative and so we don't get played on the radio. It's the only frustrating part of it. We move like cages. While commercial radio played it safe all through the 80s, college stations championed the alternative. With not only us, but a great deal of the other bands who were operating, you know, getting played on college radio, playing in a lot of clubs all over the country, and yet because they didn't sound a certain way or dress a certain way, American commercial radio wouldn't touch it. And now, alternative music is forging the mainstream with the crossover success of Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I think rock and roll and music you know, it's definitely at its healthiest uh, point right now with uh, what's going on, um, where the Chili Peppers are the dominant force. And I think the most exciting thing about also what's happening now mu musically is that um, there's no divisions. You're right, there's a lot more, but we couldn't include them all. One of the bands that broke big this year is Pearl Jam. Their debut album, 10, has sold over 3 million copies, and three members of Pearl Jam went platinum with an album called Temple of the Dog, a collaboration with two of their fellow Seattleites in Soundgarden. In September, Pearl Jam played the MTV Video Music Awards, and here they are performing Jeremy. <laughs>
The Red Hot Chili Peppers also played the MTV Video Music Awards this year, and Nirvana and Sonic Youth dropped by the MTV Studios to give us private performances. All that and more is on the way right here on the Alternative Year in Rock. Michael Franti and Ron Say of Disposable Heroes of Hip Hop. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter Bucket, and you're REM. Yeah. I don't have any boogers on me, do I? No. Very, very embarrassing. That's grungy, right? That's what's selling these days. Hey, can I wear that flannel shirt? Wild, wacky stuff. Tease Rob me. I'm such a. I am such a. Welcome back to our year-end celebration. 120 Minutes presents the alternative year in rock. I'm Dave Kendall, and 92 wasn't just the biggest alternative year, it was also the broadest. Alternative used to mean miserable Englishmen with silly hair, rather like myself, in fact. But now the music has sprouted a myriad of mutations. Here's a look at some of this year's alternative trends. In 92, techno took over the club scene hypnotic synthetic sound that evolved from early craft work has now diversified into hardcore techno industrial techno rave
trance. Breakbeat. And a techno hip house hybrid that's merged into the mainstream. We enjoy it because we're using our imagination and letting it run wild and creating something new with all this wonderful technology. Techno is more than music. Rape culture has its own clothes, its own drugs, and its own technology. For kids who want their music hard, loud and angry, hardcore punk has been replaced by industrial. I'm basically influenced by my surroundings. These are pretty aggressive times. The heralded industrial revolution didn't happen, but the first Nine Inch Nails album went gold, while the new EP entered the Billboard pop chart at number seven. Some older industrialists increased production and some fresh faces cemented the mold. But by far the year's biggest story... You must be talking about grunge. Grunge. <laughs> grunge. Yep, the rise of grunge. The structure of early 70s rock energized by the passion and attitude of late 70s punk. One of the main things in common is just the punk thing, you know. We're white boy guitar oriented rock. The epicenter of the grunge quake was Seattle, where the spotlight on the megastars helped expose the smaller acts. Yeah, yeah, no one's there now. Nobody like... toured at that point either, so everybody hung out. And, I mean, now we don't get a chance to see anybody. I mean, we come home and Soundgarden's on tour, and you know, they come home and we're on tour. Or... That's why we're all together going to quit the business at the beginning of next year. Right? We're going to go fishing. We're quitting the business. Some of the music we've covered this year on MTV's 120 Minutes. Right now, the biggest alternative band in the world is probably Nirvana. Their second album, Nevermind, has gone quadruple platinum. And last September, we helped start the ball rolling when we world premiered the first video, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Right now, here's Nirvana with an exclusive performance at the MTV Studios. This is Drain You. One baby two.
Also performing at the MTV studios this year were Morrissey and Sonic Youth. Just some of the goodies to come here on the alternative year in rock. Welcome back to the Alternative Year in Rock. I'm Dave Kendall from MTV's 120 Minutes. So far this year, our two-hour Sunday at Midnight Showcase has played 450 different alternative videos, and here in the 120 Minute Studios, 56 different musicians drop by to say hello. Here are some of 1992's most interesting moments. Welcome to MTV's 120 Minutes, two hours into the future every Sunday night at midnight, 11 central. My co-host tonight is Joey Ramone. Dave, are we in the future or what? We are, or we are like breaking into the future every second as it goes uh -huh. by. We're all counting on his divine intervention, yeah. Stop that, it's silly, it's stop that. Hey, he's Dan. He's Dave. We didn't make the Olympics, we're from Soul Asylum. Hi, I'm Sean Dixon from the Soup Dragons. Hi, you're watching 120 Minutes on MTV, and I'm Peter Buck. I'm guest hosting for Dave Kendall, who was gone. Robert Smith, you lied to us, man. You told us the cure were never going to tour again. Um, I meant it at the time. It wasn't <clears> a lie. It wasn't a calculated lie, anyway. I was just mistaken. Your lips lose me, your eyes move me colder than the rain. Be sure that it's true when you say I love you. It's a sin to tell a lie. Thanks. Well, thank you. That's an old Sex Pistols number. Isn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think so, Jess. I'm Dirk. And I'm Sydney. <laughs> We're from Sea Cubes. Hi, I'm Sasha. And I'm um, Anesh. We're KMFDM. Hello, I'm Nikki. And I'm Phil. And we're from Alcoholics Anonymous. No, we're not. We're from Lush. Hi, I'm Jim from the GSM and this is my big brother, Willie. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm Chris. I'm Tom. And we're Buffalo Tom. Hi, I'm Tony Halliday from Curb. My name is Henry Rollins, and I'm in the Rollins band. Hi, I'm David Byrne. Hi, I'm Bob Mould from Sugar. Hello, I'm Ian McDulloch from Liverpool. Hi, I'm Suzanne Vega. Hi. I'm Steve Wynn. Hi, I'm Johnette from Concrete Blonde. Hi, this is Dean Wareham from Luna. I'm Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth. Hi, I'm Courtney Love. Courtney Love is the best sex I've ever had. Yes, most definitely. One of the greatest alternative bands of the 80s was definitely The Smiths. Since they broke up, guitarist Johnny Marr has played with Talking Heads and The Pretenders, and he's currently a member of Electronic and The The. Smith's frontman Morrissey has been just as busy. He's released four solo albums, and this summer he sold out an arena tour. But he still found time to stop by here to give us a private performance of the first song on his latest album, Your Arsenal. Here's Morrissey with You're Gonna Need Someone on Your Side. Day or night, there is no difference. 
difference You're gonna need someone on your side Day or night There is no difference You're gonna need someone soon And here I Ever since the Sex Pistols sang Anarchy in the UK, politics has played a big part in alternative music. This year, Sonic Youth shot a spot for Rock the Vote. L7 formed the abortion rights group Rock for Choice. U2 developed a long-distance relationship with Bill Clinton, and many bands played political and social fundraisers. Groups like Greenpeace, Handgun Control, and the National Rifle Association were just a few of the many attractions on Lollapalooza 92, an alternative Woodstock on wheels that wound up as one of this summer's most successful tours. Here's a wrap up. Uh, I was here last year, I had a great time, and I'm back for some more. I'm the host tonight, and I'm gonna introduce all the groups. There's a lot of flavors going around today. No, we want to send the roadies bungee jumping before they uh, go on stage just to keep them on their toes, you know? You guys are playing second on the bill. But why so early? A lot of people might have thought you'd be, uh, you know, co-headliner or something. Well, that was the, the reason that we decided to do the tours because, uh, I mean, if we could play early, uh, we get, get a chance to see the rest of the band, so uh, it, it, it's a low-pressure situation, and we're at the point where it's the end of our touring year, and it's going to be good just to go out and have fun. walking around just checking out the stuff, you know, looking at the girls and then, you know, you check out some stuff and learn something. You can learn about things or you can just go beat on the big metal thing. I think, you know, people have probably one group that they really came to see, but uh, are going to be able to bear with and learn a lot about the other groups that's on here, too. Lollapalooza was one of the hottest tours of the summer, and with most of the 36 dates already sold out, it looks like Lollapalooza 2 is going to be even bigger. The headlining band on Lollapalooza 92 was the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and it was in 92 that the punk, funk, rap rockers really broke through. After nine years of almost non-stop touring, their fifth album, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, went triple platinum, and Flea, Anthony and Chad were joined by new guitarist Arik Marshall at the 92 MTV Video Music Awards. Here are the Red Hot Chili Peppers with Give It Away. I'm a 
You too, Sonic Youth and the music that made it out of the underground. Still to come here on the Alternative Year in Rock. I'm Dave Kendall, and we are looking back at 1992, the alternative year in rock, a presentation of MTV's 120 Minutes. The show clocked a lot of miles on the road this year, and our cameras caught the alternative action wherever it was happening. Here are some excerpts from the 92-120 travelogue. I wish I was in Tijuana. I'm Dave Kendall, this is John Rotten, and we would like to welcome you to sunny Tijuana. Mm, I always told you, California is the place to be. <laughs> One of the famous Tijuana sites is, of course, John Rotten trying on a dress. Hey, John. Uh, uh, fancy meeting you here. <laughs> Jesus, it's Elvis. 
Now that's the reason I'm here. Sheer bad taste. Welcome to the Special Events Center in Tampa, Florida. Opening date on MTV's 120 Minutes Tour with Blind Melon, live, Public Image Limited, and Big Audio Dynamite 2. If I have my time again, I would do it all the same. If you had your time again, would you really do it all the same? Well, I'm going to have to just off, off, the, off the record one, this one. <laughs> <laughs> It's live on the slide, Ed. This is how you uh, warm up for your shows, right? <laughs> this is how we warm up for our shows at the Special Event Center in Tampa. Put your soul in the water. You're in there for a swim tonight. Yeah, it's been two years, but here he is again. Let's hear it for Peter Murphy. Hell is all I'm asking. This week we're coming at you from San Francisco and here we are in Union Square where Manchester's James are making their debut US live performance. We are spending the next 120 minutes on MTV in the company of Mr. Andy Partridge from XTC. Andy, what's the most outrageous thing you've ever done in a park? <laughs> Cut. <laughs> oh, come now. I understand this is a family show. Roll over Jack Kerouac. They used to call it noise, now it's known as grunge, but however you name it, Sonic Youth have been playing it for the last 10 years. With seven weeks on top of the alternative radio chart and serious commercial success, their seventh album, Dirty, has given the band from New York's Lower East Side a clean sweep of mainstream America. Sonic Youth stopped by the MTV studios to give us an exclusive live performance of the album's first single, written about their friend and former Black Flag roadie Joe Cole, who was murdered in Los Angeles late last year. Here's Sonic Youth with 100%. The way you write the girls They rule the world and love you For blasting the underworld I stick a knife in my head For thinking about your eyes But now that you've been shot dead I got a new surprise but I've been waiting for you just to say This after chick is mine All I know is you got no money But that got nothing to do with the good times Now can you forgive the boy who Shot you in the head Or should you get a gun and Go in and get revenge A hundred percent of my love Up to you to I never thought you'd take off I always thought you'd go far But I've been around the world a million times And all you men are slime the gun to my head, but I am dead. Waves would rock his dad's crack. Live up next on the alternative year in rock.
Governor Clinton doesn't think foreign policy is important, but anyway, he's trying to catch up. You may have seen this in the news. He was in Hollywood seeking foreign policy advice from the rock group, the rock group, U2. Now, understand I have nothing against U2. You may not know this, but they try to call me at the White House every night during the concert. Hello, uh, is that the White House? It is. Ah, it's only good. Um, I, I'm actually, I, I'd like to speak to the president if I could. He's not available to the phone. You're watching a special presentation of 120 Minutes with Dave Kendall. It's 1992, the alternative year in rock. Everybody has a different idea of what alternative actually means and which of the more commercially successful bands still qualify as alternative. Some people argue that because U2 are just about the biggest band in the world, how can they still be alternative? We think they still have an edge because their music keeps changing, their ideas keep developing, and we like them. So when they asked us if they could co-host 120 Minutes, we said, oh, all right. And we went to visit them in Los Angeles during the first leg of their Zoo TV tour. You two on the Zoo TV tour. It's the ultimate collision of art and science. The important thing about Zoo TV is that it's, it's science under the control of people. Now the Edge man has some pretty serious machinery here. Edge, what does all this stuff do? Well, sometimes it's beyond me. You know, each 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 preset is a, is a song, but I've also got the, I'm playing keyboards at the same time. You're playing keyboards with your feet? Yeah, so the feet are working. I'm also singing, so it's, it's a bit of a complicated song. The Zoo TV tour features songs off the more recent U2 albums. There's, there's maybe one song off The Unforgettable Fire and the rest is off the album since then, right? Yeah, it wasn't really a plan. It's just that's the way it worked out when we started putting the set together. Uh, the older songs just didn't seem to belong. But uh, we're going to change the set around as time goes on, so maybe the old songs will re-emerge. We're using the TV screens for text and uh, images that sometimes are the band performing on the stage but sometimes it's things either picked out of the the atmosphere from satellites or stuff that we've got on tape we wanted to go out and do something that um you know challenged the audience i think we got some smart people in our audience and i think that they're ready for the ride i suppose what zoo tv is about is exploring the difference between information and truth
From a concert up in Toronto, that's U2 with Bullet the Blue Sky. And that's it for 120 Minutes Presents 1992, The Alternative Year in Rock. Thanks for supporting alternative music, and thanks for wanting more out of life than the daily drudgery of the top 40 lifestyle. For the past six and a half years of 120 Minutes, and for The Alternative Year in Rock, I'm Dave Kendall. See you later. Smash, crack, push, whack. Tie another one to the rack. Rock and roll. Nobody tells you where to go, baby. What if I ride? What if you walk? What if you rock around the clock? Tent, 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 tent. What if you did? What if you walk? I'm Kurt Loder. And I'm Tabitha Soren. And this is Year in Rock 92, a look back at a year more than anything else of major change, both in music and in politics. It was a year in which long-simmering black rage boiled over into rioting in Los Angeles, and U.S. voters decided to make a fundamental change in their political leadership. Musically, it was also a year in which U2 went from serious to satirical. Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose went to court, and a whole bunch of bands found their lineups in flux, including the Red Hot Chili Peppers, who abruptly lost longtime guitarist John Frusciante, but replaced him with Arik Marshall in time to make the second annual Lollapalooza tour. But maybe the biggest music story of the year was alternative rock. Groups that were previously the preserve of college radio audiences really sold some records, putting their fringe status way behind them. Here's a closer look at the year in alternative rock. Definitely this year, alternative is, is kind of where it's at. It's a big word now, it's a buzzword, you know? I think the whole general trend, though, was getting away from bland, boring music that has been played to death. Boring is the last thing you call the music put out by a group of Seattle bands that would forever change the face of commercial music. You must be talking about grunge. Grunge! <laughs> hey, can I wear that flannel shirt? It would have been like Nirvana comes along out of the underground that has the real spirit of, you know, you know, it really expresses something that's going on in the culture and it's not just a, you know, commodity. I really don't know why it's happened. I'm glad that it has just because of the fact that, you know, I mean, so many great bands now are getting a chance to, to tour and, and and to get their music out and stuff. Other bands that suddenly attracted whole new audiences were the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Soundgarden, and The Cure, all of whom went on to claim top positions on the pop charts. We inevitably become part of the mainstream if we sell a lot of records because, you know, that's what the mainstream is, really. I came to the place I love. Take me now I listen all the time, and I don't hear us on the radio anymore, on college radio. 
and it kind of hurts me because I feel like they think that we've abandoned them or that whole scene because we've, we've achieved, achieved all this commercial success. But that's not true. We've done, we're doing the same thing we've always done. It's just more people are paying attention to it now, and that's not our fault. By not taking their success too seriously, the Chili Peppers proved they hadn't lost their infamous sense of humor. Personally, I just prefer to be a corporate whore, and I just want to make money and sell. And sell and sell, and I want more, and I want more money, I want more money. Let's get into it! Lee and the rest of the Red Hot Chili Peppers helped their cause when they joined forces with Pearl Jam, Ministry, Lush, Ice Cube, Soundgarden, and the Jesus and Mary chain part of what turned out to be the most successful touring package of the year, Lollapalooza. I do think Lollapalooza definitely awakened a lot of people to alternative stuff. I think it's like addressing an audience that maybe hadn't been really addressed by the music industry ever before. One of the first bands to reap the success of alternative music's newfound popularity were New York hardcore outfit Helmet. After being courted by 12 major labels, Helmet got ready to hit the big time this fall. Members of Pearl Jam had to be surprised this fall when they found themselves in the unlikely position of having played on four albums in the top 40. Their own debut, Mother Love Bone's last record, the Temple of the Dog album, a tribute to the late Mother Love Bone lead singer Andy Wood, and the soundtrack for Cameron Crowe's movie, Singles, which featured many Seattle bands. This was also the year that alternative bands took over the MTV Video Music Awards. Now that alternative music has found a permanent home on the charts and the airwaves, will a new style of music emerge and claim alternative's former underground status? I guess alternative is now mainstream and almost commercial, so there's going to be an alternative to the alternative, which will be like sub-alternative, but not quite alternative enough to be accepted commercially, which I don't... What did I, I just say? I don't know. Few groups more fully define the concept of alternative rock than a Seattle-based trio called Nirvana. Not all that long ago, Nirvana was just three more guys with long hair and guitars. Not exactly a revolutionary act. But then grunge became a concept, too. And what with the drugs and the baby and the chart-topping album, well, this was the year in which Nirvana was dragged, kicking and whining, into the pop music mainstream. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we have three fine young men from Seattle. Here they are, Nirvana! Nirvana's second album was a cobweb-clearing blast of feedback-addled rock and roll that sent the record itself straight to the top of the Billboard chart last January and woke the glitz-infested pop mainstream to the news that there was still, indeed, life underground. From what I've been told, like, we proved that uh, independent alternative music's a viable commodity. <laughs> Nirvana's exhilarating, stripped-down music was a sensation, but the band itself was wary of big-time rock stardom and started canceling shows early in the year. Rumors immediately started building about the group's weird behavior and allegedly wasted lifestyle. We decided to lay low, and obviously that was, you know, someone would, would say, that, oh, that's because Kurt's on heroin the whole time. It's just like, I've done drugs in my time, and I don't think anyone should do drugs. In February, Kurt Cobain married Courtney Love, leader of the Los Angeles punk band Hole. She became pregnant amid rumors of heroin use, and the press dubbed them the Sid and Nancy of the 90s. But Love gave birth to a baby girl, Frances Bean, in September, and Cobain began adapting to fatherhood. Well, it's a bit wet. His nipples are really sore. <laughs> As the chart-topping spearhead of the Seattle invasion, Nirvana was the hottest rock band in the land. But the group declined to mount a major tour, turned down opening act offers from U2 and Guns N' Roses, and decided instead to play just a handful of shows in the U.S. and Europe. Rape me, rape me, rape me. Now for all your lawn care needs, it's Nirvana! Now, I'll say the winner. Nirvana smells like team spirit. Nirvana. And that guy took a shot. Did you see that? He 
you're still alive, I'm still alive. Nirvana ended a very successful year by releasing an album of old indie label rarities and live tracks, originally called Throwaways, under the title Incesticide. <laughs> All that really matters at the end of the day is the records we put out. If you can put that record on, listen to it, like, hey, that's a good record. I mean, all this other junk is just irrelevant. Great band. Nirvana was also a part of the Washington Music Industry Coalition, which helped overturn that state's so-called erotic music law this year. We'll have more on the year's politics in just a moment. And we'll also have U2, Madonna, and Guns N' Roses, so do stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Year in Rock 92. Nobody in politics ever paid much attention to young voters until this year, when the combined efforts of the voter registration group Rock the Vote, MTV's own Choose or Lose campaign coverage, and other groups brought the issues and the candidates to young people in a new and more immediate way. Our Choose or Lose coverage started in the snows of New Hampshire last winter and continued right up through Election Day, when a record turnout of young voters helped bring to an end 12 years of Republican rule. Here's how it all happened. It is time to change the direction of this country. We do have to have change. We have literally changed the world. It is time for a change. 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 I want to change the character of the presidency. Change. 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 That's all you'll have left in your pocket if you put him in there. The early primary season was filled with a lot of Democrats, early character questions. Didn't inhale. Didn't inhale and an incumbent president still high from the outcome of the Gulf War. We can bring the same courage and sense of common purpose to the economy that we brought to Desert Storm. And we can defeat hard times together. From the very first primary, voters made it clear they were interested in the issues, like the stalled economy and unemployment. Ultra-conservative Pat Buchanan reaped the benefits of voter dissatisfaction when he made a strong showing against the president in the New Hampshire primary. So I think what we have now is not only a contest between two candidates, but a contest for the soul and the heart of the Republican Party. Jerry Brown championed change with his grassroots style and 1-800 number. People are being manipulated to see politics as irrelevant, even though that if just the kids who watch MTV all went out and voted, they could change this country. <laughs> the mood of the country was reflected in a plain-talking Texas billionaire who said he could fix the gridlocking government, turning a traditional two-man campaign into a three-way free-for-all. And I will not run as either a Democrat or Republican, because I will not sell out to anybody but to the American people. Perot zeroed in on the deficit. Well, they've got a point. I don't have any experience in running up a $4 trillion debt. While the president got heat for his negative campaigning. We have heard everything that's coming out of Governor Clinton and the ozone man. We've heard everything that they think is wrong. We tried this once before, combining the Democratic governor, the small southern state, with a very liberal vice president and a Democratic Congress. America does not need Carter II. Carter II. Clinton connected with voters by sticking to the issues, specifically the economy. No more trickle-down economics. Instead, we're going to give people incentives to invest in American factories, American small businesses, American jobs, American goods. If George Bush went out to Hollywood and made a movie, he would have to call it, honey, I shrunk the economy. The president is caught in the grip of a failed economic theory. The Democratic convention was unified for a change. The noticeable difference at the Republicans' party was an open-door policy for the conservative right wing of the GOP. Protect the unborn child in his mother's womb. When family values are undermined, our country suffers. Vice President Quayle continued his family values mantra he'd introduced earlier in the campaign when he targeted a TV character for advocating single motherhood. <laughs> 
The role of television radically changed the campaign of 92. The candidates appeared more regularly on non-traditional programs, making their message available to a more diverse group of voters. Would you be as willing to go back on MTV while you're president and do an interview as you would to be doing, to be doing your State of the Union address? I'll do that. I'll come back on MTV as president. So Young people, what they want, and their votes became a hot commodity. Economic opportunity is really the most important issue to young people today. I'm pro-choice and I'm pro anyone who is pro-choice. I believe in what Bro was saying earlier on, and after he pulled out, I think that I really lost a lot of faith in him. I think a lot of people did. Clinton's got a very good platform. It's just that they should they don't highlight uh, Tipper Gore and the PMRC. If she gets into the White House, what more she's going to do? I don't care what anyone says. I think Dan Quayle's hot. This is really the young people's election. That's if right. they vote, if they come out and vote, it is their election to shape their future. The more people that register, the better. I've gone on these programs saying we ought to register and we ought to vote. I think we do better when people do. You gave Washington a laser-like message to listen to the people. I urge you, the young people of this country, to participate in the political process. The teacher and the nurse had as much power as the president, the billionaire, and the governor. You all spoke with equal voices for change. This is obviously just the beginning of a new era in politics, and MTV News will continue to follow the new administration's policies as they affect our viewers. While politicians battled it out in the real world, the rest of us were weathering a musical assault by certain songs that just wouldn't go away. Songs about big butts and guys who were too sexy or who hated everything about you. Here, one last time, is a look back at the 1992 Songs That Wouldn't Die. <gasps> what is that band? Jump around! Pasteurized, processed, cheese, metal. It's either me or Millie Vanilli. It's Wiggity 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 Whack! God. What was what was my man, sir? Mix a lot, Scott. Her butt. It's just so big. Baby got that. Yeah. <laughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie. But what I'm into, at least in the hood, what we like, big booties. <laughs> oh, mama mia, mama mia. Mama mia, let me go. Not like a dance that you just can't do, so everybody can jump. It was written at the same time. We were both in the studio, you know. That record came out like a week or two before ours, so it's really, that's what I call hip hop gridlock. The most noticeable thing would be bam, left eye's condom over her eye. Bam! It's catching. Boom! I need it in the morning or the middle of the night. I, I kind of like that song, I'm Too Sexy. There's these huge bald guys. They are so huge. And you wouldn't think a big guy would sing like this. And he's like, I'm too sexy for my shirt. So sexy, it hurts. We want the album to look like the way we think we come across, which is slightly crass. <laughs> <laughs> I think slightly is better. <laughs> too sexy for Milan, New York, and Japan. Nirvana tune, the one that was on the radio. Nah, they don't stick in my head. That, Maybe they stick in your that head. That was forced into my head. Still the end of the road. End of the road by Boys to Men. I've never heard of it. Good. I think we're probably like the luckiest band in America at this point. We all got on. That was amazing. That was what kept us together, Stanley. And now it's just the money. <laughs> 
Right, said Fred, not since the Beatles. I'm probably one of the few people in the country, including Nirvana themselves, that isn't sick of Smells Like Teen Spirit. One of the very few, Tab. We're going to take another quick time out, but we'll be back with Arrested Development and the year in rap, Megadeth and the year in metal, and Race War in Los Angeles. Stay with us. Welcome back to Year in Rock 92. The largest urban uprising in recent U.S. history had its beginnings last year when white Los Angeles police were led on a high-speed auto chase by a black motorist named Rodney King. The cops finally caught up with King and beat him to the ground, and then continued beating him, an incident that happened to be recorded by a bystander with a video camera. The Rodney King videotape shocked the nation, but last April 29th, a suburban jury in largely white Simi Valley, after viewing the entire tape, virtually acquitted the white police officers, setting the spark to long, smoldering black resentment in the gang-ridden ghetto of South Central L.A. We, the jury, in the above-entitled action, find the defendant not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Not guilty. <laughs> That was how it began. A group of white cops acquitted of the videotape beating of a black motorist. The country was shocked, and in Los Angeles, a storm of black anger quickly erupted. The whole world knows justice has not been done. That we're looking at a miscarriage of justice. Oh, God help me. The cops out there feel that they got a license to kill anyway, and um. You know, a beatdown just goes with the program. In black neighborhoods where police were perceived as the enemy anyway, the Rodney King verdict was seen as the final insult. Young black males is a target right now. It's open season. It ain't, it ain't rabbit season or duck season. It's young black male nigga season. I want to say one thing. I don't give a fuck about cops. If they ever harass me again, 187, I'm a straight killer. People know how I feel about the cops. If, if they cool cops and they doing their job correctly, I'm 100% behind them. But if they're brutal and they out here doing wrong, there's no love whatsoever in my heart for them. The explosion in South Central LA quickly spread to other districts of the city, an orgy of arson, looting, and beatings that grew into the worst civil insurrection in recent US history. And it was almost like going through Vietnam. You know, it was just, you know, eerie. We've been talking about it for years, and uh, nobody seemed to want to listen to us. But now, you know, we got their attention. Local rappers such as Ice Cube and N.W.A. had already warned about the firestorm of black anger that was building in the city's ghettos. Police coming straight from the underground. A young nigga got it bad because I'm brown. And not the other color, so police think they have the authority to kill a minority. I'm glad it was an uprising in L.A. We needed it. I probably would have looted if I couldn't afford half the things that, you know, those people were running out the stores with. Hollywood burn, I smell a riot going on. Enterprising Korean shop owners, resented by many black rioters, watched helplessly as their stores were looted and burned, or in some cases, bravely stood their ground. Don't you understand what we're, what's happening to us? Okay, what? Why do we have to destroy ourselves? Why do we have to destroy our own town and hurt our own people and kill each other? Well, it's sad to turn around and see people who say that we are destroying our own community when we don't have a community because we don't own the community. I understand what the kids are doing out in the street. We just have to get the message to them that that is not the way to go about it. Can we all get along? Can we stop making it making it horrible for for the for the older people and? And the, and, the, and the kids. After the National Guard restored order, citizens and celebrities attempted to organize a massive cleanup, an effort that's still somewhat stalled. America has to go through some type of, you know, radical change in order for people to realize that people get too comfortable here and think everything's okay. And uh, I hope it doesn't have to go, go, go down again, but uh, I think people are ready to do it again. You can drive down the street and see the burnt buildings. You can see uh, the actual events that took place here. So we'll never forget it. The four white police officers acquitted in the Rodney King case will be brought up on federal civil rights charges on February 2nd. Back on the music scene, 1992 was another big year for rap, with Ice-T under fire for his notorious cop killer track, Arrested Development providing the theme to one of the year's biggest movies, director Spike Lee's Malcolm X, and Ice Cube releasing the first rap album ever to debut at number one on the Billboard chart. 
Perhaps rock analog, hardcore metal music had a pretty lively year, too, distinguished mainly by Meltdown. Tennessee. Tennessee. Rap, it is a business, it's a job. From Georgia this year came a group of men and women calling themselves Arrested Development, and their mesmerizing southern hip-hop sound, they called it life music, put them on the rap map in a major way. You know how a lot of rap songs come, it's like they almost seem to flow out of the city streets. They like flow out of the concrete. Ours sort of flows out of the dirt. Rap continued absorbing influences from all over the world this year, most notably the dancehall reggae sound of the Jamaican streets, which spawned its own new stars, such as Shabba Ranks and Supercat, and also livelied up the tracks of such established rappers as Ice Cube and Heavy D. After a sophomore nosedive, New York's hyper-eclectic Beastie Boys regrouped with real live instruments for their third album, Check Your Head, and found themselves swept up once again into the top ten. The long-running EPMD racked up its fourth hit album in 1992, and through its management company, scored with such protégés as K-Solo, Redman, and Das FX, collectively the Hit Squad. As far as EPMD managing us and being artists, I think that's a plus for us being that, you know, they've been through some of the stuff that we're about to go through. <laughs> the provocative Bay Area rapper Paris contemplated assassinating the president for crimes against black people on the incendiary track Bushkiller. Don't lose sight, ready? Two, three, and now! I think the powers that be should be glad for these kind of records because it's a way to, to vent frustration. In January, Public Enemy railed against one state's refusal to make the late Martin Luther King's birthday a holiday with a track called By the Time I Get to Arizona. By year's end, the King holiday was approved. Rap and metal both feature big beats, and one rapper who crossed over was Ice-T with the notorious track Cop Killer. I got my club off. I got my head like dirt off. Cop Killer created such a firestorm of controversy, including death threats to record company employees, that Ice T finally decided to pull the track from his album. I'm not apologizing. What I'm doing is dealing with their grief. They're, they've made a big issue about this one song, okay? So, really, what I'm saying is, songs off the record, shut up. Megadeth has always been pure metal, and with this year's Countdown to Extinction, the finally stabilized band had its biggest hit to date. Many less stable hard rock lineups, however, found themselves part of an epidemic of metal meltdown. Well, there's so many people getting fired that, that we think that Vince Neil should join up with Steven Adler and, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and call themselves fired. Splintered along with Motley Crue were the lineups of such acts as Judas Priest, Anthrax, Poison, Cinderella, Motorhead, and the Scorpions. The epidemic of defections also reached down into the ranks of smaller bands. Assemble your own rock band from those delectable leftovers. Well, somebody who has assembled his own band is former Guns N' Roses member Izzy Stradlin, who came back this year with a new group, the Juju Hounds, and a new album. But Guns N' Roses themselves held fairly steady in terms of their lineup. In every other way, though, the band remained as wildly unpredictable as ever, as you may remember. Hey, take that! Take that! Singer Axl Rose spent 11 months of this year a very wanted man in St. Louis, Missouri. Well, thanks to the lame-ass security, I'm going home. The problem stemmed from assault and property damage charges filed in the summer of 91 after a riot erupted at a GNR show there. I'm saying, yeah, I jumped off stage and yeah, things went haywire after that. And I maybe I could have handled it better or whatever but no one was really handling anything at that point. Almost a year later, a judge saw this video footage and found Axel guilty of all charges. <laughs> Different city, same scene. In the middle of the Guns N' Roses tour with Metallica, there was another riot. The show in Montreal started off on a bad note when Metallica's James Hetfield suffered severe burns from a pyrotechnic explosion. Then guns started playing, but when Axel cut his band set short because of problems with the monitors, the unhappy crowd started rioting.
But the band trudged onward, playing three-hour-long Blood, Sweat & Tears concerts to sold-out stadium crowds. We stuck in there and, and made our point, so that was, that, that was a great achievement as far as I'm concerned. It was definitely the hardest tour that, at least for Guns N' Roses, we've ever done. In between shows, Axel made time for heavy-duty psychotherapy in an attempt to deal with the abuse he suffered as a child. Where, like, someone goes, like, once a week to, like, work out their problems for like a half hour, an hour, and I was doing four or five hours a day, right. you know, like every day. Is it helping? And you were at the show tonight, it seems to be fine, and I'm in a good mood now. The band also found time to make elaborate videos and add a couple of spouses to the GNR family. Duff McKagan took a second plunge into the matrimonial sweepstakes with girlfriend Linda Johnson, and Slash gave up his bachelorhood to marry model Renee Saran. I, I tried everything to avoid, you know, tying the knot because I was scared to death of it. And uh, there came a situation where it was one or the other, and I, I opted for getting married and, and staying with her. And once I did that, it changed me completely. In 1992, Guns N' Roses battled the growing pains of career adolescence, and after headlining in 16 different countries, has grown enough to call its own shots. We've only just begun. Um, we've only have, what do we have, what, uh, four records out, you know. We're still babies. We've got a lot to achieve. Specific achievements from Guns N' Roses you can look forward to in the near future include Duff McKagan's first solo record and an album of punk cover tunes by the whole band. Can't wait. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with Madonna, the rock and pop response to AIDS and some of the year's biggest tours. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Year in Rock 92. 1991 had been an awful year for concert tours, with such acts as Whitney Houston, Paul Abdul, and Steve Winwood sucking dust on the recession-plagued tour circuit. 1992, concert business improved, and some apparently recession-proof acts took their shows on the road. I might have something to do with them. Weren't all that many good bands touring last summer that people really gave a f about. 1992 was a stellar year for concert goers as a host of big name acts returned to the stage. Genesis, Guns N' Roses, U2, Metallica, The Cure, Eric Clapton, Bruce Springsteen, Ozzy Osbourne, and Def Leppard all drew packed houses wherever they played. The thing with the recession is bands like us, we're always going to be okay until, you know, until we don't make a good album that nobody buys so then we can't do the tour. Acts searched for ways to guarantee a successful tour in 92. One was to herd crowds into stadiums. Stadium attendance increased from 30 million in 1991 to 157 million in 92. Acts also tried to attract fans by staging enormous, almost theatrical productions. You get into a thing where you got to make sure that your stage isn't just bigger than your last one. It's got to be as good or better. Everyone thought bigger was better. The Black Crows opted to play only small theaters. I think these sort of theaters and these sort of sized places really allow us to do our own thing. And plus, it's, it's for right now, it is the statement we want to make to the people who really dig the Black Crows and to sort of say the megalomania of the recording industry is not how you have to do it. We're going to do it again like we did it last year, 1992. Believing their safety in numbers, some well-known bands chose to appear on the same ticket, which was the main draw for one of last year's few successes, the Lollapalooza Tour. Organized by former Jane's Addiction member Perry Farrell, Farrell once again successfully took his traveling circus of tattoo artists, advocacy groups, and assorted pranksters out on the road for Lollapalooza 92. It's just like I say, a coffee house for the youth to discuss what's going on in their lifetime. And this is a, a great, wild lifetime. Eric 
Clapton and Elton John made selected appearances together, and heavyweights Guns N' Roses and Metallica, proving the rumors were true, staged this year's most powerful double bill. A lot of people in the media like to just think that this tour was never going to happen for months and months and months before we played the first show. It was like, this tour is never going to off the ground. There we were at RFK. The eternally touring Grateful Dead, last year's top concert grocer, ended their summer tour after frontman Jerry Garcia was struck ill, but still managed to earn a spot in this year's top ten. Bruce Springsteen, without his traditional backing group, the E Street Band, embarked on his first tour since 1988. I'm just looking forward to playing right now. I haven't played in a long time. And yeah, you miss it, you know, you miss, you miss that face-to-face. While Bruce reunited with his fans, Ozzy Osbourne called it quits after 23 years of touring. Maybe. It may be, it may not be, I don't know. It, I mean, when you said the, 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 the last tour could go on forever, you know. Fans weren't exactly flocking to see such acts as Warrant, Paul Abdul, and Richard Marks this year, though. Wilson Phillips couldn't even arouse enough interest to get a tour started. And with record sales well below his previous levels, Michael Jackson didn't even bring his world tour to the States. Do tell. Another major act, Madonna, was nowhere to be seen this year, at least not on stage. She was everywhere else, though, as you're about to see. What are you looking at? Yeah, what are you looking at? I love it, and look at it wearing. I've got some globes you can wear. I don't know, vote for Clinton. Oh, the pressure. Oh, oh ask a better no. question. The most important thing is that I say the things I want to say in my music or whatever expression that may be, whether that's writing a book or writing songs or, or acting or, or whatever. It was another great year for Madonna, with a hit album in the charts, a scandalous sex book topping the bestseller lists, and a $60 million deal with Time Warner that established the one-time boy toy as the head of her own maverick multimedia company, a mogul with total control. When I say I want to be in control, I simply mean I have a dream, I have a vision, and I want to execute it. Wish me luck. Madonna spent the spring in Portland, Oregon, shooting an erotic thriller called Body of Evidence. Less steamy by far were her appearances in Woody Allen's low-key Shadows and Fog and the box office baseball hit A League of Their Own. What if my uniform bursts open and, oops, my bosoms come flying out? You think there are men in this country who ain't seen your bosoms? League also spawned yet another number one hit for Madonna, the delegate This Used to Be My Playground. This used to be my playground. Madonna also popped up in a wisecracking environmental spot with Seal and rocked the vote by coming clean on her political record. Think your mind, there's nothing to it. Vote! All right, all right, I never voted, okay? I, I registered to vote, though. Okay, 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 I never registered, okay? But I thought about it. Madonna's bare-breasted appearance at an AIDS benefit fashion show by Jean-Paul Gaultier kicked off a month of Madonna mania, culminating in the heavy-breathing hit album Erotica and the pseudo-hardcore fantasy photo book Sex. A lot of the things that I deal with in my music and in the book is in particular with the repression that's going on in America right now. So I think that the timing is very good. It's a fantasy. The whole video is a fantasy. My book is a fantasy. And so I'm not actually saying, this is what you should go out and do. Tell I think that people make a big deal about it and act squeamish and Ow! <laughs> scream about it being scandalous because, you know, they're bored and they haven't got anything better to do. <laughs> Ultimately, what the world gets out of it and what they choose to see, I, I can't control it or predict it. And there's a lot of really narrow-minded people, so um, if I can change the way that one one-hundredth of them thinks, then I've accomplished something. 
the one and only Madonna, whose new movie, Body of Evidence, minus the really steamy bits trimmed to get an R rating, will be out in January. But we'll be back before that with U2 and Elton John and other rockers for AIDS. But first, some fond farewells to people that will be missed. The big hits in fashion for 1992 reflected the big hits on the billboard charts. Some were hip-hop, some grungy, some X-rated. And then there were some people who seemed to be just everywhere. Totally crossed out. Androgyny is just, it's a, it's a freedom to me. Some people say my marketing is better than my filmmaking. Here's a flannel shirt over there. And that's the story of flannel. I think they're being recognized as as being more than just faces. You gotta move it. Come on and move it. You gotta move it and move it and move it. Baby, let me show you how to do this. You gotta move this. You're doing fine. Welcome back to Year in Rock 92. The styles of 1992 were on view at many an AIDS benefit this year, a year in which the biggest stars of rock and pop music finally got behind this cause in a serious way. From this moment in time, every single that I release in America from this point, will, uh, all my proceeds will go to AIDS research and AIDS charities from this moment on. Yesterday. Elton John has been the music industry's undisputed leader in the fight against AIDS this year. He established his own Elton John AIDS Foundation in November, and the last song, which is about a father reconciling with his son dying of AIDS, was his first single to benefit AIDS charities in the U.S., though he's been donating in the U.K. since 1989. Elton also played a lot of benefit concerts this year. He headlined a show for the Liz Taylor AIDS Foundation with George Michael, he appeared with Sting at designer Gianni Versace's benefit in Milan and in Los Angeles at the AIDS Project LA benefit. And of course, he joined Queen and the biggest all-star lineup of the year at the Concert for Life, the Freddie Mercury tribute to raise awareness about the disease. Everybody is aware, they're just very selfish, just like we are, I mean, I'm not preaching about it. And uh, this is more like uh, an AIDS reminder. The conservative estimate for the year 2000 is 40 million people on this planet will be infected with HIV. Of the world's 10 to 12 million people that are HIV positive now, 40% are women, and 71% are heterosexual. In fact, new AIDS cases among homosexuals are down 2%, but up 1% among heterosexuals. Yet a recent study showed that among American heterosexuals with multiple sex partners, only 17% used condoms. There are still no cures or vaccines available, and to top it all off, scientists found 30 AIDS cases with no trace of HIV. So the benefits rolled on. <laughs> In Excess, Crowded House, and other Aussie bands played for 100,000 fans in Sydney, Australia to raise money for a local hospital. I think it's a bit of an easy cop-out to go out and buy a record and lay the guilt on the rock star to change the world. It's too easy and it doesn't change the world. The only way it does is when everybody listens and changes their lives and the way they do things. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., there was a benefit mosh fest for ACT UP LA and the Magic Johnson Foundation. It's not a gay disease, it's not a straight disease, it's everyone's problem, and we gotta deal with it, knock it out now. Two benefits for the Pediatric AIDS Foundation raised over $200,000. Well, I came to L.A. Um, tonight for the Amphire Jean-Paul Gaultier benefit. Raise money and awareness for AIDS. Nobody is immune to death in any way, you know, especially when it comes to contracting HIV. 
everyone stands an equal chance and everyone should you know take an equal stance gonna rock the latex my friends the pet shop boys and salt and peppa played for life beat the music industry's aids foundation founded in april come on all the fellas let's practice sex all right we're just glad that they asked us to come and do our song let's talk about aids which is also a single and if you buy it the money will be donated to aids research yeah. <laughs> Pet Shop Boys and Salt and Pepper, as far as I'm concerned, are leaders. Uh, hopefully, they'll be looked at as heroes. You know, people say, "Well, Bob, we just had Wembley a couple of weeks ago." Wembley was about Freddie Mercury. AIDS continues, and Wembley is over. Sales of U2 single One benefits AIDS charities, and the Red Hot and Dance album continues to draw in much-needed funds. The government's not going to help, so everybody has to pull their resources and pull their talents and their creativity and come up with ways to fight AIDS. Basketball star Magic Johnson quit President George Bush's AIDS commission in disgust this year, but with President-elect Bill Clinton on his way to the White House, Johnson was said to be considering returning to the commission when Clinton takes office. Also joining in the battle against AIDS this year was the Irish band U2, whose hit single One was accompanied by art from the late AIDS-stricken painter David Wojnarowicz. U2 also mounted the single biggest grossing concert tour of the year, an ultra-high-tech outing the band called Zoo TV. Welcome to Zoo TV! Hey! We don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. So it, it must, must be, be ours. <laughs> It's kind of information overload, um, music, visuals, text, Zoo TV is, is the point where it all converges and gets spurted out, you know. I think Zoo TV for me started during the Gulf War. Like everybody else, I, I, I actually I channel hopped through the Gulf War. <laughs> And I do think it's a complete load of crap. I'm basically come here for the money. Yeah, there's a lot of kitsch in the show. It's sort of Las Vegas trash. I enjoy some of the more absurd sides of rock and roll. It's funny. I mean, four jerks and a police escort. I mean, that's funny. Celebrity and stardom is a kind of bullshit that you can try to ignore and pretend doesn't exist, which is what, the way we took on the 80s, or you can just blow it up and laugh at it, and which is what we're doing in the 90s. And we may actually become the rock and roll monsters we've always you know, abhorred and <laughs> wanted to be. One of the things about rock and roll stars is that they're bigger than life, they're bigger than the audience, they're right. almost intimidating. Well, this whole set is like that, right? That's right, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that off-putting? Doesn't that kill intimacy, though? It does. Yeah, absolutely, but you look great. <laughs> Despite some satirical rock star affectations, you too continued to loudly support such organizations as Amnesty International and Greenpeace, and even found a role in the band's show for President George Bush. Understand I have nothing against you two. You may not know this, but they try to call me at the White House every night during the concert. The president is not available to the phone. He's not in? George isn't in for my call? Have a good evening. On the national radio talk show Rockline, however, you too did get a call from Bill Clinton. This is Bono here. How do you want us to call you? Do you want to call us, should we call you Governor or Bill? No, you call me Bill. All right, and uh, uh, you can call me Betty. Uh. Zoo TV's high-tech flexibility enabled you too to appear at the 1992 MTV Video Music Awards show in Los Angeles via satellite from Detroit. See you later. And in England, MTV contest winners were able to interact via satellite with a Zoo TV concert in Sweden. What do you, uh, what do you do for a living, sort of thing? I'm a factory worker. I don't make lots of money like you. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's a shame. <laughs> the truth of it is, is but we're loaded. It's fair to say we are a bit drunk on our success. If we didn't enjoy this, we're going home. Well, there you have it, a year of major changes in music, politics, and American culture at large. We'll be charting these changes in the year ahead with special emphasis on prejudice, racism, and the crying need in this country and around the world for tolerance. So stay with us in 1993. And stay tuned to MTV News.
It was all very zoo TV tonight, where people getting married, where people getting laid, people getting drunk, and some people were listening to the music. Just getting drunk, getting high, getting laid, and getting pregnant is not the key to a great new country. If you had it to do over again, would you inhale? Wait, is that a Seattle question? That's still a Seattle question. Uh, I thought alternative was when there was a girl in the band. Next thing you know, Criss Cross is the biggest thing in the world. Like, where did I go? Maybe I'm a little mentally disturbed. Still love it. No, 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 no. They took my shoestrings out so I didn't hang myself. Mm -hmm.